So I just want to say that, you know, understanding India is a fairly big topic. So what I want to say is that I just want to lay a context. You know, India is not a stationary thing where if I explain to you, it's just going to be all clear to you. It's a moving target, and we are all moving targets. And India as a country, it's on the move. It's changing every day. So I want to show a few, talk about a few things that give you the context of where I'm coming from. And I really want to explain to you or introduce you to India through the people more than anything else. So I want to give the I want to do this in the metaphor of a pot, okay, with water in it, and there's a lot of stuff, a lot of mud, a lot of muck that over a period has settled down at the bottom. So when you look at the pot, it looks beautiful, you know, clean water up on top, but there's a lot of stuff in the bottom. If you stir the pot, what happens? All the muck gets as part of the water, and you actually see everything there is. It's ugly, it's painful, but that's the truth. And then you can come up with a solution how to strain it and get really good water. So just think of that overall metaphor, and I'll go through uh, the conversation about India in that metaphor. So first I want to talk about, um, you know, to understand India, you need to understand first its history. You know, everybody thinks of Taj Mahal. India has been ruled by just about everyone, the Hindu kings, the Muslim monarchs, the, the, the Dutch, the British. Everybody has ruled it. So there is a sense of acceptance in India. There is a sense of no matter what happens, I'm going to see through it. And so we don't think of, oh my god, these guys were all bad, it was terrible. We still celebrate the symbols they left behind as our own. So the, in the, from a sense of history, it's, there is a sense of acceptance. And do not for a minute misunderstand it to be a weakness. And this is the mistake a lot of people do, is that just because somebody is quiet, is not saying anything, is accepting, they think that they are not strong. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Amartya Sen wrote a book called The Argumentative Indian, and I think Gandhi won uh, you know, independence for us just by his words more than anything else. So uh, acceptance is the first thing. Then the second thing that's interesting is with, uh, you know, with someone like Gandhi, we talked about the pot, and you know, over the years, India has taken on, okay, all the rulers, all the fighters, you know, all the muck has settled at the bottom. It seemed like everything was okay. But when someone like Gandhi came and said that it's not okay, he's just a symbol, it's not just one person who said it, he just said, we need a real free India. And he stirred the pot. When he stirred the pot, everything came up to the top and people fought. And, but still, they used the same principles of nonviolence and they won. Freedom. So the second context to remember in India is that when we fought for freedom and we got freedom, a lot of ambiguity came up. You know, people started thinking about what is it all about? You know, there is so much poverty, there is so much richness, there is such divide, there's tremendous amount of illiteracy, there is all these things. And so for the most part, in, there was a time when the clicker, okay. So there's a time when India, you know, in my time in 80s when I came to you, when I went to US, etc. the perception of India was a poor country. You know, it's the symbol was the slums, it was the poverty, it was the poor. That's how people looked at the country. And something happened around the turn of the century, you know, in the year 2000 or so. The, the technology started, you know, there have always been a lot of engineers in India, there have always been a lot of people in India. And when the Y2K problem happened, suddenly the whole world needed a place where they needed to get some solution. So they turned to India. And in between, what also happened is that in 1991, the economy of the country opened up. When we got the independence, it was a socialist state. You know, it was a big government, it was the public utility companies, it was the IITs, it was all the big stuff. But in 1991, when the economy opened up, the entrepreneurship started, the tech companies started, everything started flourishing. And then when the Y2K problem happened, they got to India, and India suddenly you know, gave all this technology resource. That was the beginning of the whole industry of outsourcing. So after being a very accepting country with a lot of ambiguous uh, state, 
India is now finally entering a state of ambition. It's a very ambitious country now. So what they're saying is, yes, we started with outsourcing, but really what we are interested in is original product, being innovative, being entrepreneurial. So, and you see, you see a lot of charts like this. I mean, if you go through the magazines, they say, you know, by 2050, India is going to be one of the top three countries, you know, economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But really what interests me is that I happen to be Indian, but the reason it interests me, uh, this journey interests me, is that I look at India as a microcosm of the future. Every possible problem there is in the world exists in India. You know, pollution check, disease check, you know, corruption check, anything, any problem you can think of, we have it. In fact, most of the pharma companies love doing their trials in India because most of the peoples have not been exposed to any medicines. So, um, it, you know, it's, uh, it can be seen as a positive or a negative, but the point is that every possible problem exists. And a huge potential also exists. If we think of the future as the youth, there's 600 million youth under the age of 35 in India. So if you do a back of the envelope calculation and say 6 billion people, out of them 40% must be under the age of 35, that's about 2.4 billion people. So 600 million out of 2.4 billion, a quarter of the world's youth, world's future resides in India. And the third thing that's important is that India has chosen to be a democracy. You know, being a parent of an eight-year-old, I will tell you, it is so much easier to be dictatorial. You do it because I say so. Don't ask me why. It's so much easier than explaining to your kid why they need to do something. But that's what we are choosing. And in this state of muck, in this state of uh, ambiguity, in this state of confusion, Having a democracy is one of the toughest things, but we believe that that's the only way to be. So secular, democratic country. So because of these three things, you know, because of the youth, because of the problems that exist, because of the democracy, I believe that it's a microcosm of the world. Whatever we can make it work here will work anywhere else. Um, and also, we need to, I believe, so now what I want to do is I want to introduce to you, you know, we've been talking, um, I'll go back for a second, we've been talking a lot about what is important. You know, today we talked about communications, we talked about stories, we talked about everything. But I think to understand any culture, not just India, any culture, you need to understand it through its people. So I want to introduce to you a few people who are actually defining India. In this, what I want you to remember is that 1991 is when the eco economy opened up in India. So really, India's independence should start from that day. That's when it truly became independent. So India is a 21-year-old country. And literally, anybody who's born after 1991 has a very different mindset than someone who was born before that. They are free. They do not remember the British ruling us at all. They have no sense of shortage. They understand India as it is today. They don't, un they don't remember it as the time when we felt we had to leave to learn more. We had to leave to connect with people. They don't th think of it that at all. So it's a truly free state of mind. So who are some of the people and what they're doing? I want to quickly introduce you to them. Um, so there's Anupam Mukherjee first. He's got, he started something called fake IPL player. IPL is one of the biggest um, uh, games, cricket games in India. And he just named himself as an IPL player and just put a blog for fun. And next thing he knew, he had 150,000 unique users per day spending an average of 25 to 27 minutes on this site. And he became so popular that at some point he was afraid that he was going to get arrested because they thought he was really an IPL player. And then now he started a company called Pitch Invasion, which is just four of them sitting in their living room, bantering, chatting, while a cricket commentary is going on like you would with your friends. They have about 40,000 users who come there, spend about 45 minutes per day on this site. So he's building a company, and VCs have come to him. They want to give him money. He doesn't want the money. He says, I have fun with my friends in my living room. I make enough money. That's what I want. 
And then we have uh, Arpit Mohan. He is a 22-year-old college kid. He had an idea. And he went to his, somebody who he considered his mentor and showed him what he wanted to do. And they told him, you'll be a failure. Don't even do that. And he was so upset that he went home, quit the job he had, decided to do this full time. And their company is called Gharpe. Ghar means home, pay is payment. In India, over 90% of the people do not have credit cards. With e-commerce coming, people can go to cyber cafes and buy things, but they cannot pay for it because they don't have a credit card. Their solution is very simple. With vendors, they have an agreement, so they put a ghar pay button, just like there is a PayPal and a credit card, there's a ghar pay button, you click it, he sends a guy on a bicycle who collects the money from you, pays it to the vendor, and then he, he collects a charge in between. They have already gotten money from Sequoia and independent uh, um, angel investors. They are in 10 cities, 40 plus clients. They do about $400,000 worth of transactions per month. They have 65 people, of which 53 who are called payment managers. These are the people who go on the bicycles. Only 12 people are running. Now, what he's doing is that the running the bicycles may be Okay, running the bicycles may be, um, you know, uh, uh, non-tech, but he's built a very big system uh, behind. Um, and um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, the Deepak Ravindran is another guy. He has got a company called SMS Gyan. Again, we go to Wikipedia, we go to uh, Google for answers. What does somebody who doesn't have internet do? They do everything on the SMS. You send a question on the SMS, you get an answer. And uh, they have just been valued at $20 million uh, within seven months. 10 million users, 2 million a month they generate for the operators. So, and um, one of the most, in, and then these are all young people. Um, I, Arunachal, uh, Arunachalam, he's in his 40s now. About 10 years ago, he noticed that his wife was using rags a sanitary napkin. And he asked her, why do you do that? And she said, because I can't afford to buy them. And he got, I mean, this is an uneducated man who's a carpenter in a small town. He decided that he has to, he, then he started learning that 90%, almost 90% of the women in India use things like newspapers and sawdust and rags because they can't afford to buy sanitary napkins. He, for six years, he worked on creating a machine that makes sanitary napkins. And, uh, and his story is amazing. Actually, it's in The Guardian today. His whole story ran in The Guardian today. And he created now a machine that sells for about 1,500 pounds. Uh, and uh, it makes about, it, it about 3,000 napkins a day. And you can sell a packet of eight or 10 for about 10 cents. And, uh, and the, way he, the interesting thing is the way he's doing it. It's not through his company. He arranges a microcredit loan for each woman to buy this machine in a village and serve the women of the village. Because he says everybody talks about um, you know, affordability and availability of sanitary napkins. Really what's needed is awareness. And I can't talk to them. You know, uh, the, a woman has to talk to them. So he's creating almost 600 machines are out there, each woman generating about 4,000 4, rupees a month, which is about $80 a month of income, which is way more than what her husband Earns. But more importantly, he's completely committed to making India 100% healthy, you know, in his own um, way. So, and then uh, last one I want to talk to about Shirin Juwale. She's a person who's been, uh, um, her husband threw acid on her face, so she's disfigured. But she realized that, um, you know, and she wore a burqa for about three months of her, three years of her life. And when she went to a convention where there were other people like her, she realized the importance of uh, accepting that. So she has a small NGO run out of her house, two of them. They go to every hospital in Mumbai and spend time with women who are burn victims, hold them, hug them, makes their families understand why they should accept them. Small things. I think the thing I want you to understand is they're all small innovations. So. I want to quickly go, and also I wanted to say there are some people, Asha Jadeja is here, Raghava is here, Shiloh who's going to be speaking at 4 p.m. tomorrow. These are all people who are involved with what we're doing. Ask them about all these people that we are working with. And 
the thing I also want to point out, there are a lot of companies who are coming into India doing very, very interesting things. You know, people like Inmobi, Genpak, Logitech, we are working with all of them to see how do you take an idea as your identity in India and not necessarily a product, not necessarily a logo. And for example, Yum Brands, it, it owns KFC and uh, um, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell and everything. What they're doing is that one out of every 10 KFC stores is completely run by hearing impaired people. Front, back, everything. And the whole store is designed differently. So you order by pointing to things, not by saying things. Uh, the microwave, instead of a bell, it puts on a light. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, but it's completely run, and this is their uh, target: is that 10% of their employees should be completely hearing impaired. And uh, Arvindai Hospital is something that uh, um, that gives very high quality medicine and at the same time takes the profits and serves the poor completely free. Same doctors, same facilities, same services, free for one, charged for the other. What I want you to notice about all these things is that these are all economically sustainable models. Nobody is looking for donations. Every one of the people that I talk to you about is doing it in an economically sustainable way, but in a way that's enough for them and a few others instead of owning it all, so to speak. So there are three quick things I want to end with. One is all the young people, the youth, are taking the tradition along with them as they go into the future. They don't feel that they need to belong to some homogenous uh, blob to be part of this world. They, are, they keep who they are and solving local problems, local languages, local issues, which is going to be a huge trend uh, in the future. And secondly, these companies and individuals are doing this cause in their DNA. It's not like, okay, I work in the morning and in the evening I'll go to social service. It's not like I do my business and then I do 2% CSR, no. It is really, really part of their DNA. And uh, last but not least is that Every one of them is redefining success. It's not just the shareholder value, but it's also what impact are we creating out there. So we created a term called billionaire of moments. We say that a life ought not to be measured by the number of breaths you take, but by the number of moments that take your breath away. So you should measure your impact by the moments you create for others and not by the amount of money you gather in your um, in your bank. So we look at ourselves as a new age university. It's a conference we run. It's things we do all through the year. And our goal is all of us with these young people, we are learning from, you know, we all learn to earn. That's what we do. But from learning to earn, we are going to learn to learn. We just look at what if learning was the end of it all? What if that's all we need to do? What would the world be like? And how can we all learn together? And how can we all make an impact. I'm not going to run this video. Um, I just want to say that, you know, go to inktalks.com. I brought a bunch of DVDs, and it's very old technology, I know, for all of you, because you get on the online. But what we found is that in places like India, and I'm sure you know a lot of people somewhere, where it is impossible to get everything online, because the connectivity is low, etc. So we make these DVDs, we give them away to schools and colleges, and just so that they can be introduced to a new type of role models, new types of people. So we have those DVDs, give them to someone you know, pass them along as much as, as you can. And we have our conference in December. Give us ideas of speakers, and you know, we have great fellows who are doing great work. If you have ideas, you know, instead of pen pal, we ask them be a cyber pal to one of these people. Uh, participate in whatever way you can, because I want to leave you with the youth, you know, I really believe in the ancient Indian saying that we do not live on a land that we um, inherit from our ancestors, but on a long land that we borrow from our, uh, our future generation. So we owe it to them to all we need to do is understand their potential and get out of the way. And they really know what they're doing. And I'm truly, I'm so honored and impressed by the youth that I meet in India. And I hope all of you meet them one day too. Thank you. Thank you.